is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, a new tool or technique to help uh, identify STEMIs. When we look at the region, our, our data is not the best, uh, and we see a lot of confusion around, particularly uh, left bundle branch blocks and paste rhythms uh, who have ST elevation but are not truly a uh, STEMI. And so what we want to do is improve our accuracy at identifying uh, heart alerts uh, in the pre-hospital environment. And so this is a tool that I picked up from some colleagues around the country uh, in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, I looked at it. It was simple, easy to implement, uh, and uh, I think will uh, significantly improve our, our ability to uh, accurately identify uh, heart alerts and uh, and Richard's got a few uh, other uh, pieces of data. Uh, we trialed this out with District 2. They've done a great job, and so he's going to share some of that information, and we're going to sit back and uh, listen. Uh, we will make this, uh, we will record this. Uh, we will provide it to your other personnel, and we'll probably do a, two or three other live or online uh, uh, trainings, uh, as well as having the taped uh, tool for you to use with your services, and uh, just for uh, this is probably in the strongly recommended category, if not mandatory, uh, but uh, just for folks to know for agencies and sharing with, with others. But our real goal and our real intent is to improve your uh, 12 lead interpretation uh, capabilities and things. So, uh, Captain Miracle, the show is all yours. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. Well, thank you all for joining in today. We're going to spend a, just a, a brief portion of this, we're just going to go over some, some, some terminology, define some things. It's going to be a very basic uh, review of just STEMI recognition and acute coronary syndromes. And then we'll really just jump into the, jump into the meat and potatoes of the OMD physician's intent uh, of utilizing the near screening tool to help with your clinical decision making. Uh, so we'll get to that here in just a few minutes. Our goals for our presentation, we're just going to talk very briefly about acute cardiac pathology. We'll review the regional STRAC heart alert criteria, uh, and then we'll review some current trends in OMD that Dr. Manifold's already uh, briefly touched on um, in regards to provider interpretation and, and the EKGs that have been getting, set, been getting set up in the OMD. And then lastly, we'll close it out with the introduction to that near criteria and Dr. Manifold's intent. Um, we'll look at a couple EKGs at the back, applying the screening tool to those EKGs um, to help with um, provider's interpretation. But just jumping really back into defining acute coronary syndromes uh, as a brief review, you know, we're really specifically talking about the three main diagnoses of acute coronary syndromes that encompasses unstable angina, the non-ST segment elevated myocardial infarction or NSTEMI, and the ST segment elevated myocardial infarction or STEMI. Traditionally, uh, according to research, the uh, median age of time of presentation for acute coronary syndromes in the United States population is approximately 68 years of age. Doesn't mean that people younger than that can't have ACS, and we truly see that uh, fairly often more uh, nowadays than previously that they're getting uh, ACS a lot younger. And males outnumber females for acute coronary syndromes by a three to two ratio. So leading into this whole thing, it's really important that your prov our providers in OMD make sure that we're getting those 12 lead EKGs on anything that's potentially cardiac. Um, anybody with a, a sign or symptom or suggestion that there's some sort of acute coronary pathology that's going on, uh, make sure we're getting those, those rapid 12 leads on scene uh, to rule out those cardiac syndromes. Breaking down this terminology for acute cardiac syndromes or acute coronary syndromes, specifically, we're talking about unstable angina. Uh, first off, these patients are going to have symptoms of acute coronary syndrome, so shortness of breathing, chest pain, tightness, um, pain that'll radiate, uh, and then some of our milder suggestions, back pain, abdominal pains, especially in some of our select populations. But when we take these patients to the hospital with this, this you know, with this chest pain or these angina equivalents, they're not going to have a measurable troponin at the ER, even after four hours when they pull the, the repeat troponin. And they won't also have any pre-hospital or in-hospital ECG changes. So they get made with these diagnoses of unstable angina. This is a contrast to the non-ST segment elevated myocardial infarction, the NSTEMI. Um, these patients will have symptoms of acute coronary syndromes along with an, a, a recorded troponin elevation. Uh, whether that's an initial or the, the, the delta, which they pull later on at the emergency department. 
but they also present with no ST segment changes on the EKG. One of the biggest findings um, and misconceptions that I find with young pre-hospital providers that are new paramedics and, and young in the MS is that they, they truly may not understand the term NSTEMI, um, that just because someone doesn't have ST segment changes on an, EK, on an electrocardiogram on an, EK, on an ECG that this patient's having a heart attack. Uh, it's, it's a staggering number that 70% of all confirmed myocardial infarctions are NSTEMIs in the United States. So significant portions of our MIs are not going to show any ST segment changes on the EKG. And just to reiterate, that's why it's really important that we have an acute coronary syndromes protocol uh, under OMD and not a, a heart attack or an MI protocol. We need to make, treat all of our chest pain patients appropriately with aspirin, nitro, and those other interventions because a significant portion of those MIs are going to be end STEMIs and we're not going to have anything on that pre-hospital ECG. And then, and then the, uh, the meat and potatoes here, the STEMI, the ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. This is diagnosed by the emergency department for a patient to have symptoms of acute coronary syndromes, a noted troponin elevation, and the hallmark of new ST segment elevation at the J point in two contiguous leads greater than one millimeter. That's the, the baseline for our regional criteria is that ST segment change greater than one millimeter for our heart alerts. Um, that's, that's pretty much the standard across the United States. There's, there may be some little uh, changes to the, um, the amount of ST segment elevation depending on what precordial lead you're looking at, but generally speaking, that's the American Heart Association and our STRAC regional definition for ST segment elevation. Now, not all the time are we going to have ST segment depression with ST segment elevation. However, the presence of reciprocal ST repression should help confirm your suspicion that we are dealing with a, a, a true ST, you know, a true STEMI. So just because you don't see an ST segment depression doesn't mean it's not a STEMI, but when you do see it, it helps confirm that information that you're, that you're looking at. Breaking down, there's an infographic I got from Dr. Stephen Smith uh, talking about the pre-hospital electrocardiogram or the emergency department electrocardiogram uh, really just breaks it down into two. They either have ST segment elevation on the ECG or they don't. And if they don't, those cardiac biomarkers that they'll pull at the emergency department uh, will help with determining their diagnosis, whether they're having an NSTEMI or unstable angina. In our, our realm, our biggest component of pre-hospital ECG interpretation is that we're recognizing these, these ST segment elevated myocardial infarctions in the field in order to get them over to the cardiac cath lab. Um, and, and to expedite that process, just go in that time is muscle, time is heart. The faster we can get these patients to PCI uh, or to the interventionalist, the better outcome that they're, they're potentially going to have. And as we've already discussed, the ECG can only identify these two types of patients, ACS patients with ST segment elevation or ACS patients without ST segment elevation. At the end of the day, we're still doing with ACS patients. They're still having chest pain. They still have, could potentially having ischemia uh, or an NSTEMI that still needs to be dealt with. So it's really important that our providers going forward is, you know, just because that 12 lead looks nice and clean, don't fall into that trap uh, that, they're not they, that they're not having an MI. Generally speaking, in a patient with a STEMI, the more leads that show ST segment elevation, the higher their mortality rate is expected to be. And it's also really important that our providers are having continuous ECG monitoring and, and repeat serial 12 leads uh, en route to the facility. You may not be showing any signs and symptoms of a STEMI or having any uh, changes on the EKG at the initial pickup. However, on that 20, 30 minute ride to the hospital, we all know that things can change and change quickly for you. So make sure our providers are out there getting uh, repeat serial 12 leads. Now, just a little uh, breakdown of looking at the 12 lead again. This is a little bit of a, a STEMI review for our providers. Um, as you can see, we're staring at the, the, the standard 12 lead configuration on the ECG. Um, we have different regions that are going to correlate to different uh, vessels and culprit lesions uh, when we see these ST segment changes. Um, we're looking anterior, um, V2, V3, and V4, possibly um, lateral V5 and V6, also extending to lead one and AVL, and then inferior to being traditionally two, three, and AVS. We can also have septal involvement, which is usually manifests in V1. And posterior involvement would be through doing posterior leads uh, 
which traditionally are going to be uh, V7, 8, and 9 uh, when you end up doing a 15 or an 18 lead. Some other areas of involvement or things that should be highly suspect, you know, high suspicion of a uh, posterior MI is when we see ST segment depression in V1 and V2 uh, or possibly even V3 without any reciprocal changes in those other leads. So just, to, just looking at our regions of our 12 lead EKG for our interpretation, it's really important to be able to correlate where that ST segment changes are happening and the presence of any reciprocal changes that might, that might be found. A really helpful trick that I've, I've, I've used for a long time is the mnemonic pales. Uh, we're dealing with posterior, anterior, inferior, lateral, and septal. This, this mnemonic that, we, uh, that I'm showing you all helps with your providers in determining where potential reciprocal changes will be. So when you see ST segment elevation, you should look to the next letter, next letter to try to find where and scrutinize where that ST segment depression should be. Uh, for instance, if we have anterior elevation, you should look inferiorly to see ST segment depression. And a really nice little tidbit is it works backwards too. If you see depression somewhere on that 12 lead ECG, um, understand that ischemia traditionally doesn't localize. If you see ST segment depression somewhere, you should look um, in the reciprocal lead to really scrutinize to see if there's any elevation. So this is just a mnemonic that I found very helpful with our medics here at Bear County Sioux Fire Department to use um, in localizing and, and really determining where uh, pathology may be found. So our current STRAC heart alert criteria, um, this was put out several years ago. It hasn't changed very much. Um, I would just want to briefly review this and we'll talk about some of the provider pitfalls um, and misconceptions that some of our providers in OMD have, have expressed to us, whether it be my, or, you know, us at Bear County G Fire Department or at some of the other uh, OMD agency leadership. But the current heart alert criteria, the first, the first criteria is the patient has to have signs and symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. And at the bottom, it, it, it says it's, it includes but not limited to chest pain, tightness, radiation in the back, arms, neck, jaw, any combination thereof. Dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, weakness, palpitation, um, in, indigestion, syncope, or even pulmonary edema. Uh, the patient should be symptomatic or have uh, reporting some sort of ACS type symptoms. And they need to have ST sigma elevation of one millimeter or more in those two contiguous leads. At the bottom of this, it says if your patient does not meet criteria one and two, a consult should be done uh, prior to declaring a heart alert. Now we want to sit here and clear up some misconceptions or, or a misinterpretation of the current heart alert criteria because I've, I've asked a, a few providers and I asked them what the term heart alert means and some of them have said, hey, that just means patients having a heart attack. Well, heart alert is not so much a diagnosis. It's a process and it's a specific process that deals with our patients uh, that require emergent catheterization. It doesn't mean anything else than that. Um, that, that goes to include is our patient that's having chest pain and they're not showing any ST segment elevation. Uh, if they're not, you know, showing any of those acute signs of having an MI in the ECG, uh, they're, they're probably not going to meet emergent catheterization requirements for the cath lab. So when we have a patient that's having unstable chest pain, it's okay if it does not meet heart alert criteria. When our providers are, are heading to the facility and they declare this heart alert, they're actually asking not for a diagnosis, they're asking for a process. And that's to get them that express ticket to the cath lab to, to um, open up that culprit vessel and allow that reperfusion of that MI. So remembering that 70% of acute MIs are end stemmies, so our providers aren't gonna have VCG findings. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways for our, our young providers and our, and our agencies is that your patient could be having an MI and not be showing anything on your ECG. So let's talk about some of the trends that have been noticed in OMD. Dr. Manifold's received uh, some information uh, from different agencies, providers, and facilities in OMD. Uh, us as agency leaders, we've all had um, received some information um, in regards to an increase in left bundle branch block, right bundle branch blocks, and paste rhythms being sent up to MedCom as heart alerts. Many of these have been canceled at the emergency department, and they have not needed emergent catheterization. So this is the instance of a crew looking at a, a left bundle branch block, a right bundle branch block, 
uh, and calling the heart alert and, and, and not going up to the cath lab. And really that comes down to, it in, from what I've gathered, is really just a, mis a misinterpretation of the regional heart alert criteria. Uh, when we get with the Strat Cardiac Committee um, and after speaking with several of the other agency leaders in our area, you know, it's never intended that normal variant ST segment changes, i.e. ST segment changes to, due to a bundle branch block or pace rhythm was never intended to beat a heart alert. But we do have several providers that um, look at the heart alert criteria as we just saw, and they look at that process of, well, this has ST segment changes, it has elevation, so I should call this as a heart alert. They have chest pain, I see ST segment changes. And it really just comes down to using, the, of, of helping educate these, these, these young medics and saying, hey, that's a normal variant ST segment change. Those things are, are normal to the, they're, they're not normal per se to, the, to the, the patient. It's not normal to have a left bundle branch block or having a pacemaker, but it's normal uh, presentation of left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block or pace rhythm to have ST segment uh, elevation. Uh, and then lastly, we've also noticed a trend in this four consult pitfall, which we'll talk about consults and how Dr. Manifold wants us to uh, handle consults here in the future. So let's talk about some of the provider pitfalls of the, the interpretation of our current criteria. Wide complex QRSs, such as bundle branch blocks and paced rhythms, they're going to have an abnormal depolarization and repolarization of the myocardium. And if you, if you took it at face value, looking at the criteria and, and, and you look at it at face value, um, these, types of, these types of QRS complexes are going to meet uh, strack heart alert criteria, but they are unlikely to be acute in MI. If we went back a few years ago, you also, we also used to teach that a patient with a, a presumably new left bundle branch block could be having an acute MI. However, in the pre-hospital arena, we're not going to have, be armed with that kind of information. Uh, we don't have, we're not most likely going to have a, a prior EKG on this patient or a stress test or any of that kind of information when we're making these determinations in the, in the field. Um, other criteria is needed to determine the presence of an acute MI in the presence of a left bundle branch block and paste rhythm. There's, there's several different um, schools of thought on that. One of them is the Smith modification to Scarbosa. Another one that I recently just came up, that recently just found in the AHA journal earlier this month is the Barcelona algorithm, which was highly specific. Um, so we're not gonna talk about those today. We're not going to get into the weeds of those types of things of determining MI in the presence of a bundle branch block. Um, but uh, for the purposes of how we're meeting heart alert criteria under STRAC, we're going to be using this new NEAR tool to help us in determining um, acute MI in our patients. Some of the other provider pitfalls, um, the STRAC heart alert criteria is very broad. It allows us that, that window to get that patient to an emergent cardiac cath lab and have them cast. However, the strat heart alert criteria doesn't always allow for other EKG presentations that may be concerning. We have false activations and that's okay due to benign early repolarization. Benign early repolarization has normal variant ST segment changes, but with benign early repolarization, it's not indicative of an acute MI. So with these, with this, it just comes down to good provider education and, and paramedics looking at EKGs and really scrutinizing some of these things for uh, some of these other EKG presentations. Hyperacute T waves. A patient that's have a hyperacute T wave may be indicative of a left anterior descending coronary artery occlusion. That will traditionally not meet heart alert criteria. Uh, these hyperacute T waves do set off early in our um, set off early in the EKG um, if caught by the provider on a 12 lead. Low voltage QRSs with 0.5 millimeters of elevation can also be an indication of acute MI that would fall outside of that realm of our traditional heart alert criteria. And then STEMI equivalents such as DeWinter's pattern is also another one with uh, acute MIs, especially of the left anterior descending coronary artery. So to, to kind of wrap this all up, and this, and this goal is the heart alert criteria that we have is great. It's very broad. It allows us to uh, call the heart alert and get the patients to the emergent catheterization lab. But at the end of the day, it comes down to having good paramedic judgment and clinical intuition to make a good call for the patient. Now, one of the things that we have had some some issue with an OMD with some of our younger providers is, is really just a back to basics cardiology um, 
interpretation, QRS duration. As we know, the QRS duration greater than 0.12 or also 120 milliseconds constitute a conduction delay. Whenever we are dealing with a uh, QRS that's greater than 0.12 or 120 milliseconds, we will inherently have some sort of ST segment changes with it. And traditionally, those are our bundle branch blocks. And our bundle branch blocks cause abnormal depolarization and repolarization but this is considered to be normal variant ST segment changes because of that branch block. For instance, our left bundle branch block, if we, we look back into the textbook definition of it, this is a 12 VDKG of a, of, a bundle, of a left bundle branch block, secure restoration greater than 0.12 seconds, has broad monomorphic R waves in AVL V5 and 6, and that broad dominant monomorphic S wave in V1 and V2. Um, but at the end of the day, you can see that when you count these blocks, we're dealing with something that's greater than 120 milliseconds traditionally. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, the right bundle branch block. Again, diagnostic criteria is the QR restoration greater than 0.12. Um, however, there's traditionally an RSR prime in V1 and V2 and a slurred S wave in a V1, or sorry, lead one, AVL, V5, and V6. And then again, if you scrutinize this EKG, you're going to see that these rhythms are wider than 0.12. A real quick and easy method of determining bundle branch blocks. We're looking at the right and left bundle branch blocks, applying the turn signal method. When you're driving your vehicle, driving your car, and you uh, want to go ahead and turn right, you're going to you're going to switch your turn signal to the up position to go right, and vice versa. If you're going to turn left, you're going to go ahead and switch your turn signal down. And if you're looking at V1, that the pro predominant QRS deflection, that's what's really going to help you determine left versus right bundle branch blocks. But they're all going to have that fundamental tenant of being greater than 120 milliseconds or 0.12. In regards to paste rhythms, we've had several of these paste rhythms sent up to OMD as heart alerts. Um, Sometimes you may not always, depending on your monitor, you may not always see these, these demarcation arrows. This is specific on a life pack 15. They'll put these demarcation arrows showing that this is a paste rhythm. Uh, or you may also have something in the dock in the box or the computer generated algorithm that says may say electronic pacemaker. But generally speaking, a pacemaker rhythm will have wide broad QRS complexes with a noticeable ST segment change that is normal variant to the pacemaker. Uh, so really getting in here and scrutinizing this um, ST segment elevation, you really need to look back and look at these QRS complexes to determine how narrow they are and make sure they fit under that, that 0.12 criteria. So what are we trying to accomplish? We, we've just briefly gone over branch blocks and paste rhythms and QRS duration, but what are we trying to do? In OMD, we're trying to increase the accuracy of those heart alert activations by EMS. We want to supplement the STRAC heart alert criteria with a tool to help provide better accuracy to our providers with the ultimate goal of decreasing false activations due to left bundle branch blocks or right bundle branch blocks and paste rhythms. However, none of this would be successful if we ever had a miss for a true STEMI in the field. So we want to shoot for zero tolerance on missing a true STEMI patient. And one of the tools that Dr. Manifold had suggested to us back in April that I've been working with for the past few months as a training tool um, has been this near criteria that came from Lehigh Valley in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, so this is, I'm presenting to you the OMD pre-hospital heart alert screening tool. Um, providers should be utilizing this educational tool, the screening tool to help um, discern uh, the EKG that they're looking at as uh, when declaring their heart alert. And our goal with this is to help decrease these false activations um, and increase our accuracy with presenting to the emergency department. Now this near criteria, we're gonna break it down uh, specifically, the first one being has to be having a narrow complex QRS less than 120 milliseconds. That's the key that you're dealing with a narrow complex ECG. Elevation, the E, greater than one millimeter and two or more contiguous leads. That's still concurrent with the current regional guideline for heart alerts. And they also have angel chest pain or other symptoms of ACS. Again, that fitting within our regional picture of heart alerts. And then lastly, a rate, a rate less than 120 beats per minute. It's really important to know that with rate, there, there have been some recent studies that we've been reading, uh, but generally speaking, if a, a heart rate is greater than 120 beats per minute, 
more than likely it's going to be they're going to have ST segment changes associated with it, nor or the ST segment will be harder to discern. Uh, some individuals have expressed uh, some caution that MI is being greater than 120 beats per minute, but most MIs are normal cardiac. Patients actually having an acute MI is being normal cardiac. They have a normal heart rate or just slightly elevated, um, but they're usually still all under that 120 beat per minute uh, threshold. So the, the intent from, from Dr. Manifold um, is to utilize this tool when making uh, your clinical decision to call up the heart alert. How this will be implemented within the OMD arena is that if the, when a pre-hospital 12 liters run on a patient having angina chest pain, looking at the EKG, on your heart alert. If it doesn't fit in with this screening tool, uh, you'd be, it would be very unlikely. I'm not saying it's impossible. It is very unlikely that it's gonna that it's gonna be a heart alert or someone having an acute MI. And that's just going to say that if the EKG doesn't meet this criterion and you want to have a consult, it is recommended that the consults be sent directly to Dr. Manifold or another OMD physician prior to sending to the facility for consultation. So the, Dr. Manifold's intent. We're not changing the regional criteria for heart alerts. This near screening tool is to help with your provider decision making and interpretation as an educational piece for your providers in making good clinical decisions. Um, and, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Manifold here in a second, but just generally speaking, uh, on our pri previous conversations and as we brought up before, consults take up the ER's time. Um, you know, when we send these heart alerts up for consult and things of that nature, somebody has to look at them. Not all of the hospital systems around here um, have a cardiologist that has a chance to look at them right away. Most of the time it's an emergency physician in the ER that's going to look at those, not the interventionalist. Um, so um, I'll kind of turn it over to Dr. Manifold right now if he wants to provide some, some closing notes on, um, on consults and things like that in our system. Yeah, again, uh, thank you, Richard. As we talked about, our goals are to improve our accuracy of identifying uh, the pre-hospital acute myocardial infarction, the STEMI patient. And uh, we've, we've had some difficulty in doing that. Uh, this becomes an issue of crying wolf, right? The old story, oh, well, let's just, uh, I'm not sure, uh, let's call it a heart alert and uh, there's no foul and we call it in. But then the hospitals become accustomed to that and they say, oh gosh, it's just another EMS uh, call and it's not really a heart alert or we're gonna wait till we see the EKG or we're gonna wait until the patient arrives in the ED before we uh, uh, initiate the heart alert and call the cath lab team in and that. So we're, we're trying to build confidence uh, and show your, demonstrate your expertise in interpreting electrocardiograms. Uh, nobody's ever lost their job because they didn't interpret a 12 lead correctly, but we do wanna emphasize it's an important part of your job as a paramedic and we wanna make sure that you're doing it well. And it takes practice and it's being looking at these, uh, going through them and uh, Richard has a few of them to, to look at here. Uh, but this criteria is uh, put in place because I think it's really going to help a lot of folks uh, have some uh, improved confidence in their interpretations. And so really what we're doing is taking the hard work criteria and adding a, that it be narrow, less than 120 milliseconds, and the heart rate less than 120. Uh, it, it's true there can be some very few, or very few uh, STEMIs with a heart rate greater than 120. I challenge you to find those and, and shoot them to me. Love to see those. I think it's very small uh, amounts that go along with that. Uh, regarding the consults, um, if there is a question, we would much prefer you identify that uh, with your online medical direction and not the receiving emergency department. A couple of things for that. One, it helps the medical directors keep uh, uh, in tune with what's happening in the field and what your actual questions are. Uh, it allows us to provide direct feedback to you as we generally know you, know what your training is and what your, uh, uh, your uh, capabilities are. When we look at uh, who receives that in the hospital, uh, it could be the, uh, the, the clerk who's looking at that for, for goodness sake, who knows? You, you don't know whether you're getting one of the nurses, one of the doctors, uh, 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 whomever to review that when it comes back for you. The uh, other thing is it takes somebody out of their direct patient care that they're providing. And again, does it provide any valued information to you. In other words, does it change your treatment that goes along with that? 
what we want to make sure is, is that you're confident in your ability to interpret the 12 lead uh, EKG. And one of the ways that we do that for the heart alert is incorporating our regional criteria along with the, the new near criteria that goes along with that. If you choose to transmit a consult, uh, EKG for consult, please write on the EKG consult so that it's very clear because we don't uh, get a designation of that when the EKGs are transmitted. They will typically go to the receiving facility through STRAC and they'll also go to the medical directors. And so we'll look at that. And our presumption is gonna be that you sent it and you sent it as a heart alert, unless you write on their consult. But number one is we want you to have confidence in your abilities. And so that you should, it should be rare to use the consult. But if you do need to do the consult, contact medical direction, online medical direction first. If we're not available, then you can still transmit it. But if you transmit it, transmit it consult, or if you're transmitting for any reason and it's not a, uh, uh, a true heart alert, uh, please identify that and things for you. And so uh, again, with those ideas and those thoughts, this is relatively simple uh, uh, to add to your armamentarium. Uh, keep it in mind and it will improve our accuracy and uh, also improve our relationships with the emergency department. But more importantly, it will provide accurate and timely treatment for our patients that we're taking care of. And so that's all I've got for now. I know Richard, you've got a few things to, to finish up with. So thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks doc. So uh, when this was first presented to me back in April uh, here at Bear County 2 Fire Department, we, as Dr. May was talking about some of the data, we, we, we ran a small little trial with, with, we pulled 10 of our medics across uh, the shifts and presented them with 10 EKG. Some of them were uh, left bundle branch blocks, STEMIs, pace rhythms, normal sinus rhythms, binary we pulled. We, we, we pulled 10 random EKGs, 10 random medics, um, and we, we gave them the current criteria initially and um, uh, made, let them make the, the heart alert determinations based on those EKGs. And then we, we used this, uh, after a few days, we trained them on using the near screening tool that was developed. And uh, after the fact, we came back and brought them back in to make the, the same determinations whether or not they were heart alerts or not. And we found just again, this is just a, a sample of 10 medics in our organization using um, example EKGs. But uh, initially we had a 44% overcalling of heart alerts from our medics in our organization uh, prior to the near education using the near screening tool. Um, and after we implemented using the screening tool to help with their uh, their decision making capability, we brought down overcalling on heart alerts down to three percent. So three forty four to three percent, just in our small, very small sample that we did here uh, with our training. So there, uh, I've determined that there's some value uh, in using this tool for education and making these clinical decisions. That's just what we've come up with. And that's what we were able to find with it. But the best part about this is we actually have not, um, I, I can speak for only our agency, but we've had a significant decrease in just the past two months on, heart, on false heart alerts that have been sent through our area. Um, I actually haven't had a single EKG sent to our organization um, in the past two months that that was a false activation. And that being said, we haven't had, had any missed STEMIs either. So again, I can only speak for just our organization and our agency utilizing this education and the screening tool, um, but it, it seemed positive from our standpoint. Um, that's all I can, I can really contribute to that right now. Um, I implore you guys to utilize this in your education and training um, and uh, help uh, see that you guys will have positive results as well. And uh, the feedback is going to be really important that you share your feedback on this using this this tool with Dr. Manifold um, and the rest of OMD, Captain Maldonado and the rest of the OMD staff would really like to hear your feedback on this. So to close this out, we're, we're sitting about 33 minutes ahead of schedule. I want to spend a few minutes on EKG interpretation. Can I copy, John? Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm tracking. I'm just not sure what I can do to help. So really what we're, what we're, what we're proposing is that we'll provide um, Captain Maldonado, um, if you're on this call, if, if you can help push out the, the screening tool, I have it as a PDF to share with all your, your clinical staff and, and using it as a um, learning point and as an educational tool, we can send that out and just uh, any feedback that you have about it would be great. 
if that's in an email, a phone call to Dr. Manifold. I'm sure that he would love to hear any of y'all's feedback. So, but moving forward, in, did that answer your question? All right. So moving forward, um, looking at a couple of these, that we're gonna call these ECG lightning rounds. Really what we're looking at is, is looking at these 12 lead EKGs. We, in this case, we have a 50 year old male with chest pain times one hour. Uh, the, the underlying rate is approximately 80 beats per minute. And, and just looking at this, um, if we apply um, our screening tool, does this help with our interpretation on this rhythm? I.e., is this narrow? Is it a narrow complex? Is there ST segment elevation? This patient's obviously already having chest pain times one hour, so they have an engineal sign, uh, signs and symptoms. And our rate is 80, which is um, within a reason of being less than 120. So I really just ask you, what is y'all's interpretation of this? What do y'all think this is? Is this a heart alert or not? It's just a left bundle branch block. It's a left bundle branch block, exactly. And it sounded like that sounded like uh, Steve Rahm over there. So yeah, left bundle branch block traditionally. So yeah, well, thanks for contributing. I'm sorry to interrupt you here real quick. First of all, excellent presentation, uh, really, really good stuff. But I, I have a question kind of for the group, um, yeah. just something for us to think about within our departments. Um, do we know that our paramedics know how to recognize a left bundle branch block to begin with? And the reason why I ask that is because, and, and I'm not talking about the computer interpretation, I'm talking about being able to look at a, a rhythm and determine it is a left bundle branch block. Because for individuals who may not know what the electrocardiographic criteria are, they therefore wouldn't know that ST elevation is normal with left bundle branch block. So I, I, along with this there, you know, and you, you already touched on this, there has to be some education. If we have medics that, that are looking at an EKG like the one that you're showing right here, and you can clearly see ST elevation, but they don't know how to recognize left bundle branch block, they're gonna call this a heart alert every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So in this somewhere, we have to, we have to educate our medics and those who may not recognize or be able to recognize left bundle branch blocks Let's let's start there. And if it's left bundle branch block, we know, and we're not going to talk about Scarboza. I know that because I don't want to give Dr. Manifold ischemic chest pain. <laughs> we know if it's left bundle branch block, it doesn't meet our heart alert criteria. It was demoted in 2012 um, from our regional heart alert criteria. So I think that's the first question we have to ask ourselves is do our paramedics know how to recognize left bundle branch block? Yep. Thanks, Steve, for sharing that. And, and, that's, a, and that's exactly hitting the nail on the head. And utilizing the, the NEAR tool uh, will help with a lot of that discerning uh, some of that information. Our met paramedics need to look at EKGs, they need to read EKGs. Um, they, and the other thing is they need to get feedback on EKGs as well um, in order to, to know that their interpretation is correct. Uh, having a really strong QA program at your organization, doing routine, you know, uh, in-service and education on 12 lead EKGs is really important. You don't get better at reading EKGs until you start seeing and reading EKGs frequently, um, and it is a perishable skill. So uh, utilizing the NEAR tool, the screening tool, will help discern a lot of these different types of things um, with left and right bundle branches and paced rhythms. It'll help cut some of those, those types of things out. It will not fix all of our problems. It just comes down to good provider judgment and education, um, but it will help in, in decreasing some of those things. So thanks, Steve, for sharing that. Um, so we have another one here. Um, in this case, we have a 48-year-old female with chest pain times 20 minutes. Uh, the rate is, is at 58 beats per minute. Uh, and looking at this EKG, is there anything that jumps out at you right away? Uh, and if you feel, and go ahead and utilize the tool. Uh, is it narrow? Is there ST segment elevations? Are there angial signs and symptoms? Obviously there is chest pain and the rate, is the rate within criterion? And it is, it is at 58. So does anything jump out to y'all on here? Inferior. Inferior MI, exactly. Nailed it. Inferior MI. So we have ST segment elevation. It appears to be about one millimeter and two, three in ABF. And um, it's a subtle inferior. We actually have some uh, reciprocal depression in ABL, as you can see. 
Uh, and if you didn't pick up on the SC segment elevation in the first in the first couple seconds of looking at it, the AVL depression, if we're applying pales to the this whole um, assessment process, you'll see that that SC segment depression and AVL in those laterally should have pointed out uh, that inferior elevation. So if you don't see the elevation initially, that's okay. But the fact that you can use your, your ST segment depression to help localize that as well. So using two different tools for one, our near, our near educational tool and then using um, our PALES mnemonic to help us out. Uh, we have a 61-year-old male with syncope times 10 minutes rate at 60. Um, what are your all thoughts and impressions on this ECG? It's the right bundle branch block. It's the right bundle branch block, correct. So we see here, if we're looking at um, V1, you see an RR prime. Again, it's mostly indicative of right bundle branch block. We don't just go off morphology for our criteria, um, but you do have a wide complex uh, QRS in V1 that is predominantly positive in V1. Uh, so therefore, it meets, most, it meets the criteria as a right bundle branch block, again. And I'm going to go back to the criteria here for a second um, to talk about it as a group. Um, we're at this point, um, we just did a quick review of ACS, a quick review of some 12 leads and, and talked about the, the alert screening tool um, and, the, and the criteria. I'll just open it up for questions right now to Dr. Manifold. Does anybody have any questions so far or how to how we're we're looking at utilizing the tool in their educational programs for their medics? All right. Dr. Everybody's Manfred. always too bashful at this point in time. <laughs> things like that. So so uh, Rich, thanks again for uh, sharing the information and reviewing things uh, with folks in and again, the, the emphasis is to be able to accurately interpret our 12 leads. It takes skill, it takes practice. You have to have that baseline knowledge. It does deteriorate over time. And so whenever you get a, not only an interesting EKG, but any EKG, uh, it's always fun to sit down with your supervisor, challenge them, talk through uh, uh, the issues. You can always feel free to check in with your uh, agencies and FTOs, as well as call the medical directors. We're happy to participate in that. And, and I get those calls uh, uh, on a pretty routine basis, and uh, it's actually fun to, to go through that. Uh, but our, our emphasis and the reason we want to do this is it improves patient care and the identification of those patients with uh, meeting the heart alert criteria. Uh, Chief Rahm's uh, comments are apropos in that, uh, yeah, you need to know how to interpret a left bundle branch block. And if you don't know what the criteria for are for that, uh, we want you to do some self-learning look at that. Uh, we put the, some of the, uh, address that in some of the newsletters recently. And, and so again, we want you to utilize those skills and improve your 12 lead EKG interpretation uh, because these are things that are kind of the, uh, the major, uh, major pieces uh, that we want you to have. There's lots of nuances and gosh, cardiologists go to school for about eight years uh, and spend their lives looking at the nuances of EKGs and things like that. And so get the basics down. Uh, this is a, a critical component for our care uh, because it impacts what others do based on our interpretation in the field. And so uh, with that, uh, I'll be happy to answer any other questions or Captain Miracle or others will be able to address them as well for you. Don't, don't be bashful. Now's the time we've got everybody on together. It's always great to have uh, folks join in and things. So. Hey, Dr. Manfold, Steve here. So yes, um, if, if, you guys would like, um, I would be more than happy to do a web uh, webinar on going through bundle branch blocks, both left and right. Um, I can take up to 100 people on my account that I have. We can record it and send it out. I just, I can just pull that excerpt from my 12 lead class. I would, I would omit the Scarboza criteria from it. Um, just, just down and dirty. This is what a left bundle branch block looks like. So a right bundle branch block looks like. If that will provide any assistance to anybody, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, I think that's fine. Put it on the books, uh, you know, coordinate with Julian to be able to get the information out there. We love that. Uh, we love folks taking the initiative to do that. And, and also, uh, just to clarify things, I have no problems with the Scarbosa criteria. 
Uh, the difficulty is it's an extra layer or level of complexity and our building blocks are looking at the basics and moving forward with that. And uh, Scarbosa criteria, um, again, as you get more of the nuance as we talk about, uh, there are really some fun things to be able to interpret. I just don't want you to get drugged down into too much detail uh, when first we've got to accomplish, uh, you know, this goal of uh, improving the accuracy of our um, heart alerts and things like that. So don't be, uh, don't be afraid to uh, uh, demonstrate and show the Scarbosa criteria. That's no problem. I just don't want that to be a hang up uh, when it comes to interpreting your 12 leads when you go through things. So Absolutely. the more knowledge is the better is fantastic. So great. Appreciate you volunteering to do that and things. So. No problem. Uh uh, Captain Maldonado, I'll get with you offline and uh, and we can uh, look at some dates and uh, set, set something up. Take about an hour, I'm thinking, five minutes to an hour. Roger that, sir. And then, All right. Just some other closing thoughts. Um, I know we've been really inundated with COVID over the past couple months and it seems like every time you open up any journal now, it's COVID, COVID, COVID everywhere. But I can tell you specifically, uh, uh, Steve uh, found an article from January of this year on, on uh, the PREACT study about uh, cardiac arrest, or sorry, uh, STEMI recognition for pre-hospital pro providers in the field. And actually just yesterday, I ran into the one talking about Barcelona, which has a pretty high specificity um, to left on branch blocks for ruling an acute MI uh, that I just found yesterday. It was published at the beginning of this month. Seems like that we all, uh, we've been inundated with COVID and some of us have, have missed some of this literature that's come out on other topics. So if you're not, crawling around the, the Journal of the American Heart Association or some of our other peer-reviewed literature. Um, get into there and look. I've been really surprised some of the stuff that's come out in the past couple of months that we've, we've that, it is, as, that has escaped us because of uh, all the COVID stuff we've been dealing with. So don't be afraid to dig into the journals and those, those sources of literature um, to continue to add your arsenal of information. But yeah, so thank you again for Steve for sharing that with me. Thank you, Dr. Manifold for presenting for you today. Great stuff. Any last questions? No, I just wanted to say excellent job, Richard, on uh, on putting this together. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Great. Uh, we will have the recording available and we'll uh, schedule a couple more live sessions for folks in the agencies who weren't able to make it today. And again, uh, just really appreciate all you do out there. Be safe, wear your PPE, uh, and enjoy life. Uh, try and decrease those stressors out there. It's a, a crazy time in our lives, but thanks for everything that you do. Have a great day and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. I appreciate it.